All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the webinar today. My name is Ian Hutchinson. I'm Director of Sales at Duplo Cloud, and I'll be moderating this webinar today. Uh, we're going to kick things off, but before we do, uh, I've got a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded, uh, and that recording will be distributed to all registrants in the coming few days once I have it back from Zoom. All attendees are in listen-only mode with chat disabled, uh, but we have enabled the Q&A feature at the bottom. Uh, so for our panelists that you're seeing on the screen now, uh, if you have any questions, thoughts for them, feel free to uh, shoot them a message and they can either answer you directly or we'll, uh, we'll, we'll save it for our discussion that we're going to be doing at the uh, last third of the session today. Personally, I have a, a big passion for startups and that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about the, uh, the panel that we have joining us today. Each of them knows firsthand the work that it requires to, uh, to build a product and a startup. They've worn many hats, investing their time and energy into their work. And today, you'll be hearing from Venkit, Eric, Jared, and Shikar as they share their work and specifically their approach to DevSecOps automation. In terms of an agenda, I'm going to kick things off with Eric Zimmerman, who I'll introduce momentarily. I'll then introduce Venkit Tiruvengadem uh, from Duplo Cloud, an AWS partner. He's going to talk about the state of DevSecOps and Duplo Cloud's approach. We're then going to interview first Jared Gosell, CTO and co-founder of PartnerTap, and he's going to talk about uh, his experience um, scaling a, uh, a startup. And then Shikhar Agarwal uh, from a stealth startup here in the Bay Area is going to do the same. So those are going to be one-on-one -on -one interviews. And then the five of us are going to come back together for a, uh, a panel where we discuss further and answer any questions. Now, without delay, I'd like to introduce Eric from AWS. I've got a brief bio on Eric. Eric Zimmerman is on the healthcare and life science startup and investor business development team at AWS. He is also a product manager for the Biotech Blueprint, a pre-competitive open source set of tools to help healthcare and life science companies get started in the cloud. Before AWS, Eric's experience comes from both venture capital, where he was making investments in biotech and medtech companies, and on the startup side as a member of the founding team of an ophthalmology platform. His work there is still in use today as the, uh, the company is, uh, is now public. We've seen more and more investment from AWS coming in startups. So I'm excited to, to hear Eric share uh, some of the resources and programs uh, available. Eric, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Ian. And thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, I usually like to start my presentation off with a, a quote to talk about Amazon's mentality, which is a little bit unusual. Um, and so, you know, as, as Jeff said, you know, we had three big ideas at Amazon that, that stuck with us for 20 plus years, and that's why we're successful. We put the customer first, we invent, and we're patient. And I think that last one in particular um, is noteworthy for this discussion um, because it sort of illustrates, you know, not only why, but how we're able to work so effectively with startups, at least in, in my and our opinion. Um, you know, Amazon or AWS was kind of founded on the need um, that Amazon.com saw. Um, and we assumed that, you know, other businesses would need that support. And so some of our earliest customers were Dropbox and Netflix and Zynga and Reddit and Pinterest. And so, you know, from the beginning, we've really tried to prioritize working with startups because although, you know, they may not be the biggest customers right now, in three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, they're the future. Um, and so we really try to take that long-term horizon. And so that, that sort of brings me to AWS's role. And so how do we view, you know, what we do in, in the ecosystem? So for all of you science people, I'm, I have a science background and, and spend a lot of my time with healthcare and life science. So I wanted to include at least a little bit of that. Um, and so we try to go from pluripotent to differentiated and impact cells, if that makes sense. And so what that really means is that, you know, we view AWS as, as having building blocks, different products and services and offerings. And, you know, frankly, there's so many of them that it's hard for even someone that works at AWS to, to keep up. And so, you know, there's a million different permutations and combinations of ways to hook up um, all of our different offerings. And so, you know, for startups, and even for big companies, that can be pretty overwhelming. And so, you know, on the startup side, we view ourselves as, as trying to help kind of banish the undifferentiated heavy lifting. So, you know, 
how do you spin up a VPC and a VPN? Like there are best practice ways to do it. You know, we can automate that with cloud formation templates, which we'll talk more about later. Um, but there's just ways that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, same with remove friction and constraints and limitations. It's kind of that same mentality. And again, we go back to, at least in like the healthcare and life science space, we want scientists to be scientists. We want clinicians to be clinicians. We want entrepreneurs to be entrepreneurs and not necessarily have to worry about DevOps, at least for as long as possible. So that sort of goes into the building blocks of, of AWS. And so I think, you know, y'all may or may not be familiar with AWS, but just as a quick background, you know, we started mostly in the compute and storage space, you know, EC2 and S3 being our, our bread and butter, but we've, you know, gradually expanded to the database and networking and security and compliance. And, you know, this is just a list of some of the services that, that we currently offer, all of which have different specializations and configurations and product specialists and teams. And again, as I mentioned, it's, it, it, it can be a lot. So, you know, I, we, we kind of joke that, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, that there are a lot of services to master, um, but to be honest, you know, you may not need, you likely won't need the vast majority of them. So how do you navigate this, this swath? And so going from these building blocks to, you know, the next building blocks, this is where, you know, in particular, I get really excited. So this is the machine learning stack, the analytics stack, the IoT stack, dev tools. This is where, you know, in my mind, startups in particular really can excel because they're on the cutting edge of, you know, innovation and really pushing the boundaries of what our services and offerings can do. And you know, truly helping us define what the next products and features will look like. So that you know, that all goes back to startups are hugely important to us. They're the ones that you know generate a lot of the insights that we get a lot of customer feedback for. They're you know one of the groups that we really try to optimize for, and you know, we we spend an, a, a lot of time with startups. So that sort of brings me to you know my team and my role. So AWS has a, a, a function called AWS Startup BD. So we're a global team. We're almost all ex-founders, CXOs, operators, investors, some kind of combination of that. Um, and our goal is to just work with some of the highest priority um, companies and investors in the world. And so, you know, I, I think that at least my, my background is a lot on the healthcare and life science side but we have FinTech specialty, we have gaming specialty, we have AI ML specialty, we have tech, you know, the list goes on and on. And what we've really found is having some amount of domain expertise and having a group of people that have been there in the trenches that have really built and lost a lot of sleep over, you know, trying to build a company from nothing to something that it helps us both earn trust with the customers and also helps us anticipate, you know, what potential roadblocks there are. So today I was hoping to explain a little bit about like how you can work with our team and just a, a brief introduction on, on what we do and what we don't do. So, you know, as this slide illustrates, you know, one of the most common questions we get asked, get asked is, do we invest? The answer is very, very, very unlikely. AWS does not really have a, um, a, a VC fund and you know, that's just not our model. Our model is usually to be neutral and we want to lift everyone up. We're, we can't, you know, necessarily be in the business of playing favorites. Um, and, you know, we obviously have com competitive platforms and te technologies, you know, across various industries, you know, on our, our platform and we don't want them to ever feel any doubt that we are, again, playing favorites. So just get that out of the way. What we do do though, is uh, first we try to invest virtual currency. Um, so that's the AWS Activate program. So if you're a startup series A or earlier, you know, you may be eligible for credits. Um, happy to go into the details uh, offline, but if you look up AWS Activate, it's a great program and it was designed for startups to be able to tinker, experiment, break, explore, try without having to have a bill for a while. Um, so that's something you should definitely look into. Uh, second is invest time. So again, since we do have a lot of domain expertise, both on the, you know, ops side and also the investor side, you know, we really try to elevate our role of just, you know, not just being a service provider. 
and that sort of flows down into the others. So that's sharing knowledge and experience, opening doors internally and externally. So we can kind of be a Sherpa because AWS is hard enough to, to navigate for someone internally, let alone someone externally. And then that doesn't even touch on broader Amazon. So when you get to care or Alexa or com or benefits, you know, we can help try to um, grease the, the rails to make it a more seamless experience. Again, leads into removing obstacles and, and um, really just inform, influence and support you and your mission and make sure that you have kind of an executive sponsor internally. So that, you know, that's at a high level what we do. I think this, you know, the next slide is a little bit of the more nitty gritty. And this is where I think it gets particularly interesting. So the first one is on the technical side. So we spend a lot of time thinking about um, best practices. That's something that I'm personally very passionate about and part of why I'm on the, the webinar today. That again, there are a million different ways to set up a VPC and VPN and NAT gateway and do the audits and logs and configs, but not everyone needs that amount of flexibility. And, you know, I think a lot of people are, or increasing number of people are coming to us saying, you know, we need help. There's, you know, almost too many things to start. How do we make this easier? How do we low it, lower the, the hurdle to get started? And so that's where my team um, specializes in putting out quick starts. Um, so as Ian mentioned, these are pre-competitive um, CloudFormation uh, templates or CDK template deployment. Um, uh, stacks that can spin up best practice environments. Um, and so that's where the reference architectures come in. We bring in subject matter experts. And honestly, the way that we design a lot of these architectures and infrastructures are directly with and, you know, from the voice of the customer. That's really what drives all of this. The second is commercial. So that's on the external side, because you can imagine AWS and Amazon more broadly have a pretty big reach. So if there are co-marketing opportunities or POC fundings or sales referrals or, you know, introductions to venture firms, you know, there are different ways that we work with startups to try to be supportive in their journey because it's, it's hard enough to be a startup. So, you know, anything we can do to lend a helping hand, that's sort of what we would like to do. So I'm going to just quickly touch on, on some of the, the templates that I was talking about. So, you know, an example would be the biotech blueprint. So that's one of the ones that, that I'm responsible for. And so what we tried to do from a startup perspective is say, okay, what is the company you need to be in three to five years? So, you know, in this example for working backwards, you know, we, you know, in five years, we may be a clinical stage company, but before that we'd be a preclinical and before that we'd be a research company. And they all have varying needs, you know, from everything from just basic networks and security to HPC. And they kind of increase in complexity, at least in the, the life science space. And so we have designed an in infrastructure we call it the biotech blueprint core based on working backwards to say, okay, what is a platform that we can spin up um, that requires the least amount of, you know, initial lift, you know, strip away as much of the DevOps as possible, but that reduces the technical debt long term. So again, as I mentioned, you know, this sets up pretty, you know, basic meat and potatoes things, basic research VPC, management VPC, um, dual subnets, you know, DMZ subnets and app subnets. Um, it also hooks up config and CloudTrail and CloudWatch. So again, you know, not rocket science, but the more it saves you from having to do this basic stuff, the more you can focus on specialization. And so that sort of aligns with our mentality of, of trying to embrace infrastructure as code um, as much as possible. And so that's sort of where we really rely on partners like Duplo Cloud, that again, we can help um, give best practice recommendations and distill the knowledge that we've seen across thousands of startups into what is that lowest common denominator? What do they really need and want? But that will get you, you know, 80% of the way there. You still have to customize these, these platforms. And as we like to say, you know, kind of make your house a home. And that's where we need to rely heavily with, you know, on partners to help us do that. So um, that's that. Those are my slides. I want to make sure I don't go over time. So um, I'll, I'll stop there and answer any questions at the end. Thanks, Ian. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Eric. Uh, that was wonderful. I think, as, as you mentioned, uh, things change at, at AWS uh, pretty quickly, and it's it's uh, it's uh, there's a lot going on. 
Um, so it's, it's nice to have these sync ups and it's nice to have um, um, customers connected uh, within AWS. So that's great. Uh, I'm now going to move on and introduce uh, Venkit to Venkatem, uh, founder and CEO at Duplo Cloud, uh, a DevOps platform for public clouds. Prior to founding Duplo Cloud, Venkit uh, was one of the founders of Microsoft Azure, where he started with Microsoft Research back in 2005. Uh, there, Venkit wrote significant parts of the Azure Compute and Network Controller until he departed in 2013. Much of that implementation is still powering what is now the second largest cloud deployment in the world. Venkit also consults organizations in building business automation and using serverless and IoT technology. Venkit, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Eric, that was actually a great presentation and sort of a good segue for us to come in and talk about the work that we are actually doing. So, um, you know, uh, um, Eric talked about a lot of things that need to be done. I mean, uh, um, and AWS goes a, a long way in providing the quick start guides and uh, configurations. Uh, but from uh, in the context of the startup, you still have to do a lot of things, basically, right? So um, at a high level, like kind of our goal is to take those quick start guides and the best practices and so on, and then convert it into, so to speak, a button right or, or or like a, a low code kind of an approach you take infrastructure let's say if it's thousands of lines of code how do you convert it into a system uh, that can in which you just have to write 100 and you write the rest of it you know um, eric actually talked about the services and in this particular picture uh, uh, what you see is that how those services actually get realized into a sample implementation like this could be your organization. What you see over here going on is that uh, an organization have, has a few microservices. Um, they are running Docker containers. They need it connected to serverless Aurora. They need a file system. There are some Lambda functions, CloudFront, API Gateway, and so on. Right? Some of those dotted lines are also represent, so to speak, a microservices boundary. And uh, this is something that you could basically say a typical solutions architect would come up with, or you would have in some sense the broad picture of like how you want this to be. But what becomes challenging is the low level implementation details of how do you convert Docker uh, to serverless or how do you convert an EC2 host to a la uh, S3 bucket? Where do you do IAM policy? Where do you do security groups and so on? So, so that's the, so to speak, the lay of the land or the problem statement that you're really dealing with. And uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide, um, Ian. So if you were to say, uh, uh, like, what is DevOps, right? If you were to like define DevOps. So what you see is that typically an organization would go about uh, this getting into the next level of implementation, uh, like take each one of these services. You start by building a network infrastructure. You'd have your VPC, subnets, resource uh, um, uh, regions, and VPN. And uh, um, get in and once you have that in place you would start about building application infrastructure application infrastructure is a place which is so to speak really exploding and uh, aws is doing a raw lot bringing in a lot of rich functionalities right there is sql server no sql elastic search redis they are ai ml glue uh, and so many things like athena and whatnot the bare basic vms disaster recovery backup and restore all of this come over here the whole concept of this particular layer uh, in aws is to basically make the life of a developer easy but then from a DevOps perspective, it becomes really challenging because you have this fragmentation and now you need to put together all of these pieces. So you have built your network, you have stood up your application infrastructure. Now you go about provisioning your application. Now apps can be of different forms. Let's say mostly they would be containers. If you're a startup, most likely because you're your latest and cutting edge, it could be Lambda functions. If you're in the big data AI space, you could also have a lot of these uh, ML jobs and whatnot. Auto scaling, DNS, ELB, and so on, that would be closely tied together to application provisioning. Kubernetes, ECS, Fargate, all of these come over here. So you would put that together. Then you would come about uh, uh, putting together your uh, um, uh, visibility stuff, log harvesting, monitoring, metrics, something goes wrong, you need an alert and whatnot. And then finally the CICD part of it. All along, what you have to do is that you have to put in a whole bunch of security controls. Uh, a lot of startups uh, can start with something which is what we call as table stake security. 
uh, in the sense you have security groups uh, and let's say IAM policies, password management, encryption, and so on. But if you are in a regulated industry, there may be a ton of more things that you need to do, vulnerability detection, file integrity monitoring, and so on. Now, we didn't realize originally, but you know, interestingly, we started by doing more and more DevOps, but eventually we realized is that our ultimate selling proposition became uh, security and compliance. Because nowadays, especially in the post COVID world, a um, lot of startups, they have to operate in regulated industries and large enterprises. They actually don't care whether you're a startup or a large enterprise. They expect you to meet a standard. They'll expect you to meet PCI if you're in FinTech or High Trust or HIPAA. And there are a whole bunch of controls to do that. And uh, um, like, for example, these are like PCI has 79, High Trust has 80 and 50. And AWS has actually done a great job in creating a quick start guide and giving us various cloud formation templates and so on. But if you were to double click that, let's say you have 79 PCI controls on the AWS level you have to implement, give it two days. That's about 160 business days, right? I mean, uh, um, provided you have the expertise, right? So, so like, how do you deal with this? And then 70% of them have to be done at provisioning time. If you go wrong over there, then it's like really tricky and messy to go and fix it and whatnot, right? So, so those are like sort of the real challenges that a lot of these startups are actually facing. Uh, um, uh, building the full DevOps stack and being uh, uh, compliant to the regulated industries that they standards that they are actually operating in, uh, right? So um, yeah, Ian, we can go to the next slide. So what do they do today, right? I mean, when you say they actually, not so much the startups, but let's say uh, larger enterprises, they would put together, uh, there'll be a set of people and they would put together uh, uh, mostly CTOs, engineers, DevOps, and so on. They'll come together and then they will put in a whole lot of tools together, uh, um, have an infrastructure as a code wrapper to stitch all of them together and build this, uh, uh, build this pipeline, or so to say, speak the framework. And uh, different areas have different uh, different tool sets. They pick their preferences. Uh, similarly, for infrastructure as a code, they have their own preferences and whatnot, right? Security, there are tons of security tools and whatnot. So that's what they do today, okay? So, um, and we can go to the next one. So how do, let's get into the details of how do they actually achieve that. Um, when I say they, I mean, it could be startups or in general, how people have been uh, um, uh, are dealing with the, um, de dealing with this automation. You know, a few years back, there used to be a concept of templates. Uh, what it means is that you could actually write something once and kind of assume that your requirement is not going to change and just keep repeating it, right? So these are like cloud formation is to a large extent a template, but now with the CDK, they have like, uh, they have now a lot more than that. Then you have V apps, you have heat and whatnot. Now these are actually chef and puppet with the pioneers of templates actually. So these are actually great for initial setup, but in the world of cloud where the there are so many different services happening and there is so much of fragmentation. They're not very useful for ongoing changes. So people, what people started doing is that, um, uh, we can go to the next one, yeah. Uh, people started doing infrastructure as code, uh, basically. So over here, what people would do is that on an ongoing basis, as and when you have changes, you would actually write each and every change in its minutest detail uh, in, in, a, in, in a file. Now the advantage that it gives you is that obviously it gives you a lot of control. It gives you code so you can compare and see what, where you were before and what you made you change before. But this is too much of a detail. You need tremendous amount of expertise to do that. That's one. Second, the system per se doesn't expose any uh, uh, um, uh, best practices. It's code. I mean, you can go and write what you want. I mean, like for example, just like in a program uh, programming language, if you divide by zero, you got a blue screen in the same way uh, or, or a crash uh, in the same way. If you go and open a security group to the internet, uh, it's, it's fine. Uh, I mean, uh, um, the language is not going to do anything. So what people end up doing is that you rely on the person to do the right thing who's writing code. And obviously people make mistakes and you cannot always like find uh, um, always the best set of people. People add governance tools on top of it. So what it means is that either they will do a static analysis of code or they will basically go after the fact in infrastructure and say, hey, this is wrong, that is wrong, send an email, go patch it and whatnot, right? So first 
you you don't try to prevent it and then you go about trying to cure the system right so uh, so and there are like many tools which actually help that and they have their place i mean uh, and so on but you just have to see how much can a startup in this particular context afford to have all of that process so in spite of doing all of that end of the day you still have to stitch so many tools together especially the ones that are not per se uh, a, a an aws layer there's a layer on top of it right you have your monitoring tool logging alerting siem and what not so it's pretty time consuming and expensive and it requires a lot of expertise so uh, yeah we can uh, so fundamentally you know one of the common things that we find is that it's not easy to find a devops engineer because as a skill it's like you're trying to find a developer who writes really good code but he really loves ops right i mean in my experience of over so many years people are really good at ops or people are really good at code right so it's it's kind of sometimes becomes a unicorn finding a unicorn problem to actually go and find a, a good devops engineer in fact like i was chatting with uh, um uh, with somebody linkedin has 55000 openings for devops engineers can you imagine 55000 openings and like that was like a few weeks back and i was checking a few days back it's at 60000 so it's not just about technology it's about writing the right people so at duplo cloud what we sort of did is that you know how eric laid out you should do this this is the best practice this is how it should be done this is the quick start guide we actually thought you know what is it possible for us to build a so to speak a bot which can take that blueprint that you saw in the beginning and actually realize it by following a few principles first it takes the high level specification from the user Uh, which is the blueprint that you saw second it tell it asks you which uh, industry standard you're trying to comply to like let's say hipaa or pci and finally third it picks up the well architected framework that aws has published it combines all of them and it basically auto generates the topology right so you are guaranteed that by default instead of like uh, 160 days in a matter of a week after you have onboarded into the system or two week or two you would basically have a, a system which is com which complies to well architected framework and it's good to go in terms of a uh, 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 compliance basically in most of our uh, uh, customer uh, i mean this almost becomes a no op the startups focus on their product while uh, the bot takes care of the infrastructure and security and finally you can click on another button and it will generate the code uh, uh, for your system and you'll be like oh wow by the way this is the code that i would have written basic right right so that's really the, the the concept of duplo cloud like so to speak a devops bot uh, which can do this and uh, and and it's not like this is a problem that has not been solved before when aws invented infrastructure as service this is what they did like even when we were in azure in those early days of 2006 2007 we would take all these various on premise tools and put them together and then it became infrastructure as a service nowadays nobody goes and racks and stacks a server and worries about those set of tools you just assume that you're going to log in click a button you're going to have a vpc and a vm and so on so we have a vision that soon devsecops would be like that right so yeah in Awesome. Thanks so much Venkat. Uh really appreciate it. Uh I actually saw the the same the same information on on LinkedIn with the the number of of job openings. Um cloud operations has been either the number 1 or the number 2 skill in their their annual skill report for the last 2 years. Um so that's that's interesting stuff. Thanks so much for sharing uh the context on Duplo Cloud. Um we're going to move over to the second half of of today's session where we're going to interview um Jared Shikar and then come back as a as a as a panel um feel free to keep the questions rolling cuz i'm sure as i go through this uh some of the questions that i'm asking Jared aren't the questions that that you have in your mind uh so we want to capture those uh where possible uh so by way of introduction uh Jared Gostal is a a technology industry veteran who designs and leads the partner tap technology vision and roadmap Jared is responsible for R&D, leading the project team, and works closely with industry thought leaders, customers, and partners. Outside of work, Jared is a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with a passion for promoting physical fitness as a means of character building in young people. Welcome, Jared. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. 
Uh, I love a, a startup success story. Can you start by telling us a little bit about the, the work you've been doing uh, over the past four years with PartnerTap? Absolutely. Um, first, I got to say that I've learned more in the last three years doing a startup than I had in the past previous 10 years to that. So before I started PartnerTap, I was an individual contributor on e-commerce teams, on um, you know, casual gaming teams and that sort of thing. But I always wanted to start a B2B business building tools to help people work more efficiently. And I had known my co-founders for about 10 years and they were in enterprise sales. So I'd always told them, if you guys ever have a great B2B idea, please let me know because they were in sales and they knew all these little things where people are using spreadsheets and they were doing silly things that could be automated. And in my background, I, in games, I, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with those, those things that needed, those problems that needed to be solved. So fast forward three years, we've gone through multiple features and products, but right now is a really exciting time for us. So we've struggled, you know, we've ground and grind, grinded and grinded over the last three years, but now things are growing really well. So we found good product market fit. We've built tools for several roles within the channel sales teams within organizations. Let me back up a little bit and tell you what PartnerTap is. PartnerTap is a sales ecosystem platform. It's for people that want to partner outside of their organization and work together on deals. So you'll get enterprise companies like SAP Concur and ADP, and they want to go to market with a product. Like they want to sell sell two different products together to the same client. So our platform allows them to find alignment and collaborate. So it's a sales collaboration tool and helps, you know, organizations that are planning on creating a partnership to determine if there's value in that partnership before they spend a lot of marketing dollars to execute on those things. But we've learned a lot in the last three years and things are going really well right now. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Jared. Um, now, one of the, the uh, somewhat unique things about PartnerTap is I'm, I'm told you guys bootstrapped the company. Was that always the plan? And how does that impact your dev team? So we didn't exactly bootstrap and that, and that wasn't always the plan. We knew that when we started the company, you couldn't just roll in with a pitch and raise money. So we knew we had to build something and start to sell it. Um, like in, in an organic way. And so we spent the first six months to a year doing research, building paper MVPs, having user study groups on our own time and our own dime, right? And so we built a product and we started selling it right away. Like, uh, luckily my co-founders are salespeople, so they, so they know what they're doing. I, I don't know how to do this, but They'd get on LinkedIn, set up calls, like pitch this thing, get feedback. And we actually started to close a few deals. And once we started doing that, then we raised a small seed round. So we haven't done like a series A or B or any of that. We raised a small seed and that's kept us going. And we're still increasing revenue and keeping things balanced. So we're still a small team and we haven't raised a big round. But the future is we do want to raise a series A probably in the next one to two years. Got it. Makes sense. Um, tell me a bit about your, your dev team and the, the, the people at PartnerTap. Sure. So because we're on like a tight budget and, and we're bound by revenue, we have to be super careful about who we hire, right? Like we have to hire for a good fit in the culture and we focus on engineers that are full stack. Somebody that is very independent can take a project and almost even when I say full stack, I mean really full stack. We're talking back end database design, front end, we're using React, and then back end, we're using Java. And we've built a framework so that when you're, you get the requirements for, for a new feature, you're doing the design part too. You're not just writing code. You're like, where am I going to put this button? And we try to make it so that it's pretty simple for an engineer to do that. Like they just pick the buttons and the interface and reuse components. But the whole focus on our hiring is to build products fast 
And the products we build, we want to make sure we can support those because we're a small team and they scale, right? And that, and Duplo has freed us up to do that. So we haven't had to focus on um, hiring a lot of DevOps or, and AWS helps with this as well, right? Like, so we don't have to hire DBAs. We can use the AWS support and get in contact really quickly with someone that's super knowledgeable about Postgres, for instance. Like we're all, you know, we're not experts in Postgres, but we know enough to get ourselves in trouble. And when we do, we, we tap into resources like Duplo or AWS to help us out. So when I think about PartnerTap, um, even from an early day, you were selling to larger enterprises that, that have sort of a channel mindset in place. Um, at what point did, like you're, you're now SOC 2 compliant, um, you're, you're GDPR compliant. At, at what point did that uh, become a factor and, and how did that affect your, your infrastructure? Right, so we started off with enterprise um, sales, um, but luckily our first clients didn't require the SOC 2. But as we started to expand and get into clients that were dealing with government contracts and military, it became a requirement. So we actually, one of the contracts we signed said we had to be SOC 2 compliant within four to six months after signing the contract. So we had to do it. It was, and, and we wanted to do it. It wasn't just that we had to. It was finding the time and budget to do it. We'd always wanted to do it, but now, you know, we had this new client that's going to help invest in doing the SOC to audit and going through that process. Sure, makes sense. Um, I mean, no, no company is perfect. Um, maybe you can, you can, I'm wondering if you can air out any dirty laundry here and sort of what mistakes you've made or, uh, or things you struggle with today. Sure. Um, I mean, first of all, like the mistakes are pretty much endless and they don't stop. I mean, I mean, <laughs> we're all human, right? And everyone makes mistakes. Um, but what we can do is find ways when we do make mistakes, um, being aware of them, right? And minimizing those mistakes through things like CICD, uh, static code analysis, and Duplo helps us with that too. So we can trigger, you know, unit tests, code scans, and, you know, catch those bad coding practices automatically. You know, we check in our code and run a build and we get, we're aware of these issues uh, before they make it even to like a QA or staging environment. Um, and one of the other things we like to do is not only use those tools to, to automate scanning, we do manual code reviews, which are huge. Like we catch all kinds of issues with, you know, hey, this is potentially a security issue, make sure you, you secure this endpoint properly to hey, I've already written something similar, maybe we can refactor and use this. And also when we design a new system, we like to think about not only scaling it when it comes to like, you know, memory and CPU, but also how hard is it gonna be to support this new feature? We're a small team, uh, both on the dev and customer success side. So we put things in place when we, we think there's a potential for failure, we like to alert ourselves. So we don't have to think about it. We don't have to think about grepping through logs and looking at dashboards. We think ahead of time, think, well, if this thing fails, someone's not gonna be very happy with us. So let's send ourselves an email or let's collect data that's important to us and email it to ourselves every day. So we automate those mundane, like sort of maintenance tasks to make support and success easier. And that's helped us with the small startup team to, to be successful and keep clients happy while still building new features. Got it, that's awesome. Well, as a sales guy myself, I've, I've, I've always understood um, PartnerTap's uh, sort of value proposition and business model. So, so congratulations, Jared, on all your success. I know we've got uh, Sheikar waiting, so um, I'm going to hop on with him uh, over the text next 10 minutes, and then I'll bring you back uh, you. for the panel. Thanks, Jay. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, Sheikar Agarwal, um, as co-founder and CTO of his self startup, uh, is disrupting a $1.8 trillion market. Prior to that, uh, he was part of Google Brain, developing the infrastructure of TensorFlow. 
At ThoughtSpot, he also led the development of a Snowflake-like proprietary database as one of the founding engineers. Shikhar did his BS in computer science from IIT Delhi and has been recognized as one of the Quora's top writers. Shikhar, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, no, no problem at all. So I always get intrigued when I hear about a company in stealth mode. Uh, can you start by, by sharing what you can uh, about your latest startup and, and the Sage app? Right, definitely. <clears throat> so as the end tells, you know, I won't be able to share the exact market we are in, but definitely it's a huge market, as you mentioned, it's a one point eight trillion dollar market. Um, regarding the tech stack, uh, we are both wide and very deep, just to share what we're trying to do. So wide in the sense, we have to connect to a lot of third party companies because it's a legacy industry. So we need, we have a lot of dependencies on that. And deep because we are doing some hardcore, like huge Kafka pipelines, having distributed systems in sync with each other spread across geographies. Um, so, you know, it's both uh, solving very hard technical challenges uh, in this legacy space, but would I love to talk more about exactly what we're doing, but later. Okay, sure. Um, let's, let's start with the team. Um, from what I know, you guys have been able to attract some, some awesome talent from uh, both other, other sort of past startup experience and from some fairly large companies in the Bay Area. Um, how do you attract this, 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 this talent um, at such an early stage? Right, so my experience from ThoughtSpot was that if you want to create a big startup, you have to have the right like, money and right talent. Right? So we are lucky to have our investors who were ex-investors in Facebook, Airbnb, Slack. So those are the people who are supporting us. And then it was about finding the right uh, team. So using our network, we have been able to find people from LinkedIn, and Twitter, Cohesity, Rubrik, um, uh, you know, all these things. So I think the DNA is really important. Uh, just a moment, I think there's some background. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no yeah, so I think uh, attracting the right talent is a huge part of our culture and really putting in the right places. How do you recruit? How do you source? How do you interview? Uh, where it's not just about writing a bunch of code, but also cultural match becomes really important for us. So, um, sure. yeah, and that was one of my past learning from ThoughtSpot. Got it. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's certainly a, 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 a small world in some senses here in the, the Valley with, with, with VCs and, and the, some of the companies you mentioned. Uh, you've also got a, a, a team based over in India. Um, I, I believe. And can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, about working with a distributed team? Because I'm, I'm seeing more and more startups uh, do that. Right, right. Yeah. So currently, it's not just in India. We just hired uh, someone from Airbnb in Seattle. So we are setting an office there, setting up a small team in London, as well as in Amsterdam also, like in the process. And these are not just sales team, but also engineering teams uh, in these places. So a few things that we have really learned is one is be very clear about the roadmap. So like we share a very detailed roadmap for the next three months, like next quarter and a high level roadmap for next 12 months. So that everyone knows where we are heading and what everyone else is doing. Um, then we can't really collaborate a lot, like as in when we are in one place talking to each other. So what we do is uh, we sort of break down projects so that there's less dependencies among people. So very clear boundaries and very clear deliverables. So that's the other thing that we are doing uh, so that people are not blocked on each other remotely because there are different time zones and you know, everyone, even people in India, someone is like waking up at 2 a.m. in the night uh, because they just, because they are at home and that's what they love. So having clearly boundaries and roadmap defined has really helped us doing a lot of socials like we play online missionary and mafia uh, that has really helped us as a team to understand each other and sort of like informal time where, you know, uh, we just get to learn about each other. So that has really helped. And definitely there are a few challenges. One of the real challenges are like, for example, if a laptop breaks down, it really takes a few days for it to get shipped from Amazon or Flipkart in India, yeah. same, same in here. So then setting up uh, environment like cloud IDs, uh, and putting things more on cloud uh, so that even if they have their own personal laptop, which is might be crappy, but they can still log in, uh, they have Wi-Fi, so they, they can still work on it. So that has really helped us uh, overall. 
Awesome. Let's shift and talk a little bit about your, your, uh, your infrastructure. Um, I know that's something you've been iterating upon. Yeah, our infrastructure just like any as a startup, right? So we, um, we, so when we started with AWS, it's amazing, right? It's a lot, lot of uh, uh, cool things and really helps us to launch a cloud, like end to end thing uh, in very soon. But that's also the main problem because once we were choosing which database to use, we have like five different SQL databases, five different NoSQL database, document database. So it's, it was really a tough uh, decision. So we definitely iterated a lot, but at the, at the end, as of now, we have a, like, this is, we are still at MVP seed phase. So we are using like RDS, uh, Postgres as a SQL database, Redis cache, Kafka, which is AWS managed Kafka as a pipeline, uh, Cognito for authentication. And slowly we are developing our data warehouse and data lakes uh, analytical pipeline where we'll be using the ETL tool like Athena and all, and then Redshift. So we are in the process of iterating there. But yeah, a lot more is coming. Uh, as of now. And on the compute side, we are currently using ECS um, to get the auto scaling part from AWS. Sure, you got it. Um, now you recently just got started with, with Duplo Cloud. Um, I know you, you mentioned uh, that AWS has been awesome. Can you share a little bit about what led to that decision um, and what the onboarding experience has been like? Right, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I'm in love with Duplo. So, uh, so when we started, um, so what we are doing is we are storing a lot of PII data of customers, like uh, their address, phone number, but also their IDs like passport or credit card and a lot of uh, payment data like credit card data because there's some payment that they can do to the system. So security is a big concern for us and none of us in the team are like security experts. So someone, and we talked to a lot of consultants who were like, oh, hey, we can help you develop, uh, become more secure but no one was very familiar on actual implementation on AWS side. Like everyone had like fundas and philosophical discussion. Not. So that's where, the, that's where the starting point was when I got introduced to Duplo that these Duplo, they are experts in AWS uh, and understand security and we get security out of the box before, because once we launch any Redis or we launch our um, database, all the encryption keys, security groups, firewalls, everything comes out of the box. So security was a big uh, pull. Second was just expertise, because as I mentioned, there's just so much stuff in AWS. So just, and we were using like API gateway and various load balancers and stuff like that. The first thing Duplo did was, okay, this is your high level picture. Um, let us simplify it. This is just, <laughs> this won't work and this won't help you scale, right? So, so that is expertise in AWS. Uh, really helped us streamline our entire end-to-end -end system. And not just um, AWS, because we are a B2B customer, some of our clients later on would say, hey, we, we don't want to keep data into AWS, we want Azure. So now Venkat comes with a lot of Azure background. So you know, it's not just AWS, but just cross-cloud cross um, knowledge. That is really That was really helpful. The third point was there was no lock-in in the sense um, we still own our own infrastructure and all the infrastructure as code that we discovered that we'll just get from Duplo because, you know, behind the scene Duplo is generating all those things. So that was really helpful as like, at least when we were starting because we were still a startup um, and we wanted to make sure that we are not locked in into that early, right? But so those are the things that onboarding, as I mentioned, you know, it was pretty smooth. Venkat is like <laughs> 24 seven, he's working and his team is working across geographies. So really simplifying the structures, setting up with the right um, security groups and all those things helping us. Um, and other thing was that few things weren't supported by Duplo in the beginning. For example, RDS, uh, serverless, right? So once we noticed that, hey, our bills for RDS is increasing because we, are, we have our own servers, um, we just pinged, you know, Duplo team and within a couple of days, RDS serverless was implemented. So that's the other thing I really like. That the iterations are very, very quick. Awesome. So glad to hear it. So I, I want to welcome uh, back the rest of the crew, but one more question before I do, I want to give you the chance to air out any dirty laundry, anything you don't like about AWS, about Duplo cloud, about challenges you're facing as a business um, before we, we hop on with the team. Right. Right. So for AWS, uh, one was just too vast. <laughs> so I think uh, some good guide and even the documentation is too vast, like just getting started guide is small, so many pages. Uh, 
So that is one. The other thing is uh, we are coming from ThoughtFront Google. We are a core gRPC shop. And uh, currently the load balances and the um, server discovery mechanism are not HTTP2 compliant and not gRPC compliant. So that's a major issue that we are facing. Uh, on Duplo side, I think uh, uh, we would love to see a lot of improvement on the CI CD side uh, and stronger support. Uh, so yeah, so that uh, that a few, but I'm sure we'll get there. Uh, I I fully trust to you. Yeah, so always always uh, always more work to be done. Um, thanks, Shikar. Uh, let's have uh, Eric, Jared, and, and Venkit hop back on. Um, crew, feel free to turn on your your um, cameras. Eric, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, there's been a common theme of AWS is vast. Uh, and we got reInvent coming up and there's going to be three weeks of content there. Any thoughts on how to sort through content or, or ensure you're, you're going about it the right way? Yeah, uh, I think we're all trying to figure it out a little bit. As you mentioned, three weeks is uh, a long conference, but because it is longer, we can actually um, have even more content than usual. So what I would say is you can subscribe for updates if you go to reInvent.awsevents.com. And I would focus it in two ways. One would be uh, product announcements and launches and improvements. Um, so that's usually where the major kind of feature updates and new products are announced. So uh, it'll be a flurry and it may take some time to digest, um, but ultimately there'll be more and more summaries to talk about like what's new and you know what's, what's really ready for prime time. The other piece is I just uh, go down and look at some of the section titles and see if things are interesting because you know, you may be really interested in doing, you know, NLP for data ingestion or um, building a chat bot. There's all sorts of um, talks talking about solutions that have already been built that are being open sourced for the benefit of the community that you could potentially leverage uh, for your own builds. So I would just go to the website, take a look. It's not available for registration yet. If you have any questions, you can please feel free to email me and I can help point you to the right ways and uh, the speakers behind the presentations as well. Got it. Thanks so much. Um, Venkit, one of, the, one of the questions that I was thinking about as we were having this discussion uh, was around, we were talking about blueprints uh, and we were talking about Duplo Cloud. Um, when do you see startups coming for, for help? Is it when they're first provisioning their, their, their infrastructure? Um, or is organizations that are already up and running on, on AWS? Yeah, so uh, I think the, um, the answer for this is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's always invariably, I mean, like at least like 75 to 80% of the time, it's when, they're, when they get pushed by a regulator, uh, right? They're in a regulated industry, they want security and compliance, and they want to get, 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 get there, right? So that remains like the, uh, like the key uh, uh, turning point. And then a lot of them are also very forward looking. Uh, in the sense they are like, okay, you know what, I'm not going to invest time. Uh, like for example, in case of partner tab, they, they did not want to invest a lot of times in DevOps and everything else, and they wanted to focus on their product. So that remains the, the second thing. Uh, but yeah, those are the two uh, key, uh, key criteria. One is when they have to be in a regulated industry uh, and security is very important for them. Uh, um, they may or may not be asked for a certification, but they just feel that it's super important. And second is if they want to be more efficient. And uh, yeah, that's that's true for startups. Yeah. Got it. Um, Jared, I was going to go over to you with a question around uh, we've got on um, building versus buying and like how much to um, to how do you how do you make a decision on where to allocate sort of dev time versus, you know, you can't afford every tool. Right. So one good example is obviously Duplo Cloud. I didn't want to build out a whole, you know, CIC, CICD system. I didn't want to glue it all together. I wanted to be able to de deploy Docker images easily and make that all work. Another example is within our tool, uh, we needed a messaging system, right? It's like, um, I need WebRTC, I needed a chat system. Do I want to go out and build this huge messaging infrastructure and make sure it's always up and running when I could just buy it off the shelf? Uh, we use a tool called Adly.io, which is great. It uses AWS resources to, you know, duplicate across regions for stability and we get this stuff right out of the box. We have made mistakes before though, where we decided to purchase a system that would help us integrate with CRMs. And it turned out being 
too expensive and really hard to use. So we learned a lot with that mistake to actually do proof of concepts, really get deep into something before you buy it. That's what I would recommend. Awesome feedback, thanks uh, so much. We had a, a question uh, here on um, uh, DevOps salaries. Um, ben, can you speak to uh, what a typical DevOps um, employee makes in here? Yeah, I think if you're in the United States, uh, um, uh, we have never tried to hire, but <laughs> probably Jared and uh, um, Shikhar can probably know more, but I think it can range anywhere from 100, 120 to 180 if you're in the Bay Area. Uh, but in India, I think uh, it's appropriately uh, um, adjusted for uh, by the currency. But yeah, that's that's about where we are. And, and depends actually, right? DevOps, by the way, doesn't mean psychops. But that's actually another skill set. <laughs> so you are actually hiring for if you want both DevOps and SecOps, so you actually don't need to hire two people, one for DevOps, one for security. Great. Uh, next next thought was around technical debt. Uh, and this was a question specifically for Shigar and Jared, so whoever wants to take it. Uh, how did how did the two of you think about uh, technical debt and, uh, and then sort of managing a necessary evil? Yeah, so um, since Jared was on mute, I'll take take it, <laughs> take the first step. So uh, for us, you know, tech debt is always increasing. So, um, so at, at some point of time, what we decided was that we'll like we'll bucketize what we want to do. So for example, in my mind, we bucket things in three categories. One is some core differentiators that we differentiate from the industry. Second bucket is just regular sales cars that these are the minimum set of features that would enable the product to to just sell and third is tech debt. Tech debt. Um, and so we want, we every quarter we take uh, things from each bucket and that's how um, we basically, and some some quarter might be heavy on some some bucket, but that's how we start addressing the tech debt. And I think the real thing is um, what we have now, just to make sure that we don't have a lot of tech debt, uh, we are currently in a place when we do a lot of good code reviews some design doc and share the design among the team so that we can iterate on the design doc, not on code or testing part. So iterate quickly on the design doc and, uh, and then do good code reviews. Uh, that basically takes care of large part of tech debt. Uh, but yes, it, 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 it's inevitable. So it's, uh, yeah, I a hundred percent agree with Shikar on that. Like we follow the same pattern. Like, I feel like if you don't make a minimum, at least a minimum payment on your tech debt, it, your your debt is going to get out of hand, right? And things are going to start to break. And balancing that is super important with new features, tech debt. Yeah, I agree. Jared, I think there's a question for you. Oh, uh, yeah, I can read it out to you. Um, is there a primary admin for Duplo Cloud in your organization? Is the question. Uh, that would be me, yeah. I'm the primary admin. <laughs> uh, so I, I handle most of the, the build and release process within our company. Um, I try to take as many mundane tasks, not, not to say Duplo is boring, but just that, you know, it's like, uh, it's like running the books, you know, doing your bank account, like balancing the books. It's like, we got to do it right. We got to just do it right. It's like a process. So I try to do all that boring stuff for my team. What a nice guy you are, Jared. Um, cool, awesome. Um, I was gonna end off with any any parting thoughts. Uh, we'll start with with Shikar and and move uh, through Jared, Eric, and then Ben Kit. Um, Thirty seconds, and then we'll wrap. Yeah, no. For me, I think uh, uh, entire this help, like Duplo help and all the security, cloud ID, fast iteration, and really great consultancy on the entire DevOps stack, like from CI/CD. Uh, tell an entire stack uh, what database to use and all those things have been really helpful. Uh, and I hope we continue to iterate and uh, make something great here. Thanks, Shikhar. I appreciate the love. Over to you, Jared. Uh, Venkat and Duplo have been a super great resource for us. I mean, we started in the dark ages. I was manually deploying jars to EC2 instances by hand one at a time. And so he streamlined that. And then when we went through the whole SOC 2 audit, I had no idea what I was doing. And Ben Katz's knowledge and expertise and his team made it super easy. Well, it's not easy. Made it much easier. I knew what to do. I put it that way. 
Thanks, Jared. Over to you, Eric. These are incredible. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate that we understand that it's not always the easiest to get started on AWS and it can be overwhelming. So we are trying to do what we can to make the experience better, specifically for startups. Uh, and the only way we can do that is by working with partners like Duplo Cloud, um, who could help kind of extend our architectures and infrastructures and really refine the way that, that we work with customers and, and help refine these best practices. So thanks for having, having me. I, I honestly didn't want any of these questions for 30 seconds, things to be about Duvo Cloud. It, it sounds like we're paying you guys. Um, Venkit, final thoughts? Yeah, I think overall, I would basically say that in the new uh, world of cloud, right, as a product developer, as an application development, a lot of your work is actually going to be done by Amazon, right? You're going to offload a lot of components into small, small services. The amount of code that you would write relative to what you would have written 10 years back is probably at least 60 to 70% less. So while that's great news for you as a developer, but it's actually bad news for somebody who's managing your infrastructure. So I think it's really important to make sure that you pick the right technologies and you uh, uh, stitch them together correctly and then you operate and maintain them correctly. That's why there is a word DevOps. So uh, you need to bring in that kind of a culture into your ops and make sure that you make the right choices and life would really be easy if you make those right choices. And hopefully we'll see all these great startups uh, um, uh, do the right thing and scale uh, purely focusing on their business. Beautiful. Well, want to thank each of you one more time for taking the time and thank you to our uh, attendees today. Um, have a wonderful Wednesday and uh, take care. All the best guys. Thank you. Bye.